In the meantime, then, what is more important to investors? It's always a sort of a tug of war between a strong economy, which everybody likes, uh, but not if it means uh, the Federal Reserve has to postpone cuts in interest rates, which apparently a lot more investors like. It's weird, right? Uh, but fortunately, we have a weird panel, uh, actually a genius panel to make sense of it all. Uh, I'm talking about former Ted Cruz campaign pollster, Chris Wilson, former Dallas Fed advisor, Danielle DiMartino Booth, and last but not least, best-selling author of Bonson Group, a CIO, David Bonson. Um, Danielle, that's the one thing I can't quite figure. Uh, strong should be strong, and you run with that. Uh, but if it's too strong, and it lessens the likelihood the Fed presumably cuts as much, or maybe not at all in this go-round, then everyone starts selling. Why? Well, I, th I think the markets uh, are, are, are spoiled, and I think the markets have been spoiled for a generation now at this point, since Alan Greenspan started placating them. Um, but I think more to the point, you know, if you're asking the question about whether the economy is strong or not, yes, the strong headline figure that came out Friday morning, the strong headline jobs figure, that gives Powell cover to not have to raise rates by 50 basis points. we added points. this unexpected 224,000 jobs and all. all. All that. But underneath the surface of that data, things really are weakening. We saw job openings come in weaker than what was expected just this morning. Morning, um, and, and we're seeing things like multiple job holdings rise up to the highest level since 1997. So there are there are things, and even the Fed's own model, the New York Fed's recession probability model, hit 33 percent yesterday, and it made all the all the rounds because the last time it was that high was 12 years ago when we were in recession. Only one time, Neil, in the late 1960s was the indicator this high and the economy not in recession. So Powell and his compadres at the Federal Open Market Committee are really going to have to start are contemplating whether the economy merits on its own the rate cut, not whether or not the markets are throwing a hissy fit for it. All right, but you're still kind of doing the markets bidding there, David, aren't you? Yeah, you are. And, and I think she's exactly right. This goes back all the way to Greenspan. I've been talking a lot lately to clients about the famous cut in October 1998 out of nowhere. There's a, I, I don't blame the markets. I don't blame investors. They're spoiled because they have come to rationally expect the Fed will be there. But in this particular case, there isn't a, a logical scenario. A 3 6 on a employment, 3.1 wage growth, substantial improvement in labor participation force. Um, at the end of the day, unless they're going to rationalize it with this so-called insurance cut, which is a term I prefer to never hear the rest of my life, um, that, at the end of the day, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I think she's right. I think they do a quarter point, not half a point in July, but I think they're going to do another quarter point in September. And, that, and, and that's unfortunate because they have to get off of it at some point. They either lose dry powder when a recession comes or they just they kick the can. They don't have a lot of wiggle room. Of wiggle right. room. Now, Chris, the, separately. All right. Uh, we've got Chris Wilson back with us, Danielle D. Martino Booth and David Bonson. Um, David, end with you, begin with you on the, the legacy of Ross Perot. If you think about it and, and, and did all the things you're not supposed to do when you run for president, bump people out, use a lot of charts um, and just warn them there's hell coming if you don't get your act together. Uh, it's, you'd say fail, 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 fail. He, he damn near pulled it off. Yeah, he sure did. And I think that the, the threats about the spending, the warnings about the, the spending threat have really proved prescient. It's interesting. Even hearing his son talk, I think that interview you did was 13 or 14, yeah. and he said $16 trillion in debt. Well, Amazing, you know, right? just a few yeah. years he tick by that, and we're yeah. at 21, yeah. and we're going to and we're gonna be sitting here, it'll be $24, 25000000000000 trillion in just in a few more years. And and that rate of growth of the debt, I think people would have laughed off, and and yet here, here we sit. So I I think that the legacy on those warnings was very, very positive. I do believe that the net effect to the American economy was very positive around NAFTA. I think that a lot of the globalization... Yeah, that was one thing he, he didn't appreciate. He, he looked at that deal and trashed it, famously debated Al Gore in the subject. On that, a lot of people, maybe Trump would agree with him today. He would, and a lot of others yeah. would as well. I yeah. think of the things that, and the doubts he had about the original NAFTA deal are the same doubts that the president had and has yeah. with this one and the, and the revised deal. Well, and I think that he, he, you're right, there was a certain sense where he kind of foreshadowed a lot of Donald Trump. Right. I think Pappy Cannon did that in some other ways in, in the you're year right. yeah. uh, 92 as well. I think that there was um, just not the media savvy that President Trump ended up having. He became the, the persona to and take really a lot of those no things. social media or anything. Yeah. Kind of or the 24-hour cable cycle. Right. Right. Yeah. That had, who and knows? you wouldn't have been able to hear his, his, his accent on Twitter anyway, so it would have fallen flat. But, you know, the debt issue... I 
think even he'd be surprised. And the interest rates are staying this low with all that debt. Well, I mean, look, imagine where we would be had he been elected president and we would have tackled our Would we be talking about China being this preeminent competitor right. to the United yeah. States right now? Would, would, would China be the same threat that it is now if our financial vulnerability wasn't where it, it is and growing Very to well, your point? But, but the I would rate of the growth is, is, is accelerating. And, and I actually think it's even not, more than that. We need China to fund the deficits. We need exactly. their dollars yeah. coming yeah. back Absolutely. in. We don't talk about it. Right. And I think it's a somewhat complicated subject for the pe American people to understand. But really, those subjects are much oh, more right. intertwined. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, around around that right. same time, Warren Buffett actually reached out to me and said, we're mortgaging the farm. Yeah. It's a yeah. good way of putting it. All right, yeah. Bernie Marcus, Ken Langone, but particularly Bernie Marcus, the original founder of Home Depot. Maybe a lot of folks saw that interview or didn't know, and he's pointed out in many, many interviews over the years that he's a big supporter of Donald Trump, raised money for him, will continue to raise money for him, but now a lot of them want to boycott that. His customers have said, look, if one of your founders is pouring all this money in the campaign, uh, we don't want to associate with Home Depot. Back with me, Chris Wilson. We've got Daniel <laughs> Martino Booth. David Bonson. David, what do you make of this? Oh, I, I've used this expression on your show before, Neil, and I, I really mean it. I think it's a form of cultural Marxism, this form of intimidation of people in the private sector that are told they're not allowed to have certainly political opinions that are not just in the mainstream. Uh, he was elected, so it's at least something, you know, nearing half of the country in that range that happens to agree. Do you think and it would be a different reaction if he was supporting one of the Democratic candidates? Well, of course, it would be a very positive thing, but I, I would flip it the other way. If, if there was a, a corporate figure that was giving a lot of money to Elizabeth Warren, who I happen to vehemently disagree with her politics, the last thing I would do is advocate boycotting that company. People in America have a right to exercise their free speech through supporting the candidates they You're happen both to nodding like. Amen <laughs> to that. Amen to that. I mean, come on. This is, it, free speech is, is one, of our, it's one of our basic liberties. We, we lean on it. And, and just but because did I miss something? That maybe these protesters think he's actually taking money out of the Home Depot till to do this his wealth yes, is in he stock hasn't been and with the company yes. since 2002 right give me a break and this whole we're going to boycott someone is just the latest in social media virtue signaling and when it gets down to it when somebody needs a new light bulb or a set of nails they're not going to drive democrat or republican yeah. Yeah. they're going to home we'll depot and they're going to get it exactly yeah. that's right all go right. to home depot honey yes about convenience all right uh in the meantime um, i don't know whether there are any volunteers here but richard branson's virgin uh, uh galactic is going public uh investors are ready to bet on space he thinks he can easily raise a ton of money to do that, and that might pay for these volunteers he's looking for to go into space. Uh, David has already volunteered for that. But hey, what do you make of this and the, and the, and the marketing appeal of this? Yes, I, I wrote in the in the show notes, they said, are investors ready to bet on going to space? And I said, all I can tell you is the chief investment officer of the Bonson Group is not ready to invest <laughs> in it. Uh, look, if I want to invest in something that loses a ton of money and is, is this big aspirational tech play, I already have rideshare companies that have gone public here in America I can lose money on. So, no, this is a great way to shift capital capital allocation to somebody else who will be holding a bag they're going to wish they weren't holding. But All right. Uh, another item I want to get out on, and I'd love to get mm. these guys' thoughts. Uh, apartment rentals hit their highest demand in the latest period. Mill millennials apparently are not buying. It could say something of the real estate market. It could say some of them were exposed to what their parents went through with the meltdown. I don't know what it is. What do you think? Oh, gosh. Do I have a lot to say on yeah. this one? Look, I know this is a family show, but millennials need to procreate. They need to, they need to set up house and oh, home. Oh, say it's preservers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but boomers need to start selling their, home and, their homes and downsizing, and they're competing with millennials for the same exact units. This does not work. Economic, our, our economy revolves around consumption. Part of that consumption is at some point getting married, having children, and filling up a home with the things you fill up and buying diapers and all of these things that won't won't happen. The millennials have already put off settle, settling down for a You're decade. About not adult diapers, but, but not just, adult diapers. I, I guess they wait long enough. But what's <laughs> but you know maybe it's a sign of long? our times. No, it's a sign of our times, and the, the, yeah, that it's going to be look, very look tough. Look at our falling birth rate. I, I actually disagree. I don't believe that this is about I, I First of all, you have to have household formation, and I agree. You do. But in this case, this is an affordability issue. There has been a bipartisan desire to see permanently escalating housing prices. It is foolhardy and it is hurting millennials. Those who are able-bodied and gainfully employed cannot afford to buy a home. And the reason well, is because both parties have said... you used to with the $10,000 cap on mortgage interest and taxes. No, the, the mortgage interest it. wasn't affected at all by that. The, if, in terms of the, the mortgage deductibility, property taxes could potentially be, if the home goes over a million dollar price, the $10,000 well, 
thousand. My point is this: I mean, there's another reason for them not to, right? But the major issue, uh, the problem to me is that we facilitated home ownership by coddling it with tax breaks and other things like that that have put affordability out of range. The zoning laws, the supply factors, environmental, regulatory. The homes are too I expensive. I think they crunched the numbers and said it's not worth it. Regardless of what you're if, telling them about procreating. It, they need to procreate. But if they keep renting at, at record high, to your point, rentals, I mean, the, the rental rates are through the roof. No Absolutely. Matter where it, no matter where you are in America, that they'll man. never have the ability to save for retirement, much less save for a down payment on a house, or even ever pay off their student that's loans. Also, that's also a huge incentive against procreating, by the way, the, uh, against marriage and then procreating. Sure. And, uh, or another as I would reason like to, put it. to join Richard Branson in space. There you I mean, go. <laughs> Once well, you get up there. We'll, right, we'll have to see what the salt deduction <laughs> looks Look like out in the space. Windows. That means we'll have lots of millennial Nothing. volunteers. Yeah. Yay!